Hi guys, welcome to Snakes and Adders. Welcome back to another episode of our Introducing Series. Today is episode 44 and we're going to be discussing this American gem, the Black Rat Snake, Pantherophis obsoletus. This is an impressive species of rat snake that has been a mainstay of our hobby pretty much since its inception. Black rat snakes occupy much of northern, central and northern eastern United States. Well, they used to. Once again, this is a species that has suffered at the hands of reclassification and everything else. And reviewed by scientists and now the black rat snakes are restricted to west of the Mississippi River. Whereas their previous distribution spanned the total of the north. Um, previously, black rat snakes were the nominate form of Pantherophis, uh, Pantherophis obsoletus. And the complex or the, that, that group... Their triominal name was Pantherophis obsoletus obsoletus, and the other subspecies were Lindhimiri, the Texas rat snake, Spiloids, the grey rat snake, Quadrivitatus, the yellow rat snake, and Rossellini, the Everglades rat snake. And with the occasion inclu in occasional inclusion of William's Eye, which is the Gulf Hammock rat snake, and Decurti, which is the Florida Keys rat snake. The black rat snake, as described by Klaus Dieter Schultz in the monograph of genus Alafe Fitzinger, was the northernmost of the subspecies uh, and spanned from the east coast right across to western Nebraska and central Kansas. The northern extreme of their range continues into Canada and the state of Ontario around Lake Huron, Lake Erie and Lake Ontario. So to say that these snakes are tough is an understatement. Burbank studied DNA and decided that there were just three species rather than the five subspecies uh, or sometimes seven. An eastern, a central and a western race. The eastern race, including the yellow and Everglades rat snake and all the northern region of the black rat snake. So this is where yellows previously were. All that past there now became Pantherophis alleganiensis. Uh, the central race would take the subspecies name previously given to the grey rat snake and they would become the central rat snake, Pantherophis spiloides. Again, the central northern range of the black rat snake would be included here. So, that bit. From there where the grey starts all the way through would now become spiloides, including all of the black northern snakes. Uh... And then the Texas rat snake would no longer exist as science and would be rolled in with the black rat snake to become Pantherophis obsoletus, the western rat snake, which is what the ICUN Red Lists uh, website currently has, is just the distribution of obsoletus. They no longer recognise Lintermeri, which is the Texas rat snake, or Lindheimer's rat snake. Uh, it's now just all obsoletus. <sighs> Shoot me now. Thankfully, the hobby still recognises all the subspecies that have been lost or renamed. Thank God. Of course, some like to keep up with the Joneses uh, and use the latest and greatest in classification and nomenclature. But in truth, if people have been breeding a certain group of really nice textbook Everglades, say, for 20 years, just try telling them that they don't exist anymore. It's not going to happen. Wholesalers in the UK, until recently, occasionally still brought in animals denoted as the Kurtz rat snakes, Florida Keys rat snakes, Pantherophis uh, obsoleta de Kurti. Uh, and we should continue to breed for type and colour palette that we attribute to the species or subspecies. Black rat snakes, like grey rat snakes and Texas rat snakes, are born saddled. But over time... Rather than retaining the saddles like the previously two mentioned, mentioned subspecies, black pigment increases and takes over, uh, making the snake look black overall, with only faint patches and lattices of white interstitial skin denoting roughly where the saddles would have once been. Some, some races and localities are blacker than others. Um, black rat snakes generally retain an off-white or cream to the underside of their chin and the... Uh, anterior part of their their belly um, but towards the back the posterior it turns black on the ventrum so let's see if we can white white you're making it tell me funny black oh well saying that mottled on on the uh on the anal scale but yeah 
so it, there is a change yes thank you where am i so this uh black spreads through obliterates the pattern you can't really see it anymore um, giving an overall look of a black snake hence then their common name uh, they're also known as the uh, uh, black pilot snake as well uh, which is for th another reason for brumation. Um, the yellow and Everglades rat snakes, Quadrivitatus and Rosalina respectively, both stripe out in adulthood. So they're born almost grey. With each shed, they begin to develop new pigments. The yellow starts to develop, or in the case of the Everglades, the orange starts to develop. Hold on. I'm talking. Yeah, he's on you. This snake is amazing. But then those saddles diffuse and turn into um, four stripes, two on the flanks, two on the dorsum. Uh, and fully mature animals you can't really see where the saddles were at all and you just got the stripes um, the record size of a black rat snake believe it or not was recorded at 256 centimeters which is eight feet four and a half inches an incredible length recorded by ernst and barber in 1989 thankfully the ma vast majority of black rat snakes remain between five and a half and six and a half feet anything in excess of seven feet would be considered an exceptional example they occupy regions from sea level up to 1,200 metres in elevation. And it's quite obvious, according to at least Schultz's description of obsoleta, which I'm sticking to, um, um, that they will adapt to a number of different regions and biome situations. It's no good, dude. You're strangling me. I can't talk. I hang up. But their heartland is lowland deciduous forest. Uh, in captivity, black rat snakes are essentially a supersized corn snake. Um, their temperature requirements are much the same, with a hot end of between 28 and 30 degrees Celsius. Because of their larger size, a minimum vivarium of 48 by 24 by 24 or 120 by 60 by 60 will be required. Many peak keepers with larger animals would prefer to go larger. Um, oh, God. Thank you. You're holding on very tight, mate. Very tight. Um, realistically, once a snake starts to exceed uh, the size of a corn snake, heat pads will become redundant. We just simply can't efficiently heat this body mass anymore. And we would make the transition to a ceramic heat emitter, which is coupled to a reliable thermostat, preferably with a day-night control. Uh, daytime highs for the summer months would be 30 degrees Celsius and nighttime lows of 22 to 24 degrees. Substrate can be a number of different options, including beech and orchid barks, lignocell or aspen, or hemp in America they also sell quite a bit of, or a, partic a particulate mix mixed with soil to, on sands to try and make it a more naturalistic feel. Numerous hides and caves should be provided along the thermal gradient as well as climbing opportunities. Uh, some people will also use a sky cave strapped to the roof of the Viv as these animals are avid climbers uh, and will we'll sit up there quite happily. Just make sure that's towards the cool end because we're going to set the basking area directly beneath the heater so we can't have it all crowded towards the hot end. Numerous branches for them to climb on. These are active snakes and they like to investigate their tanks and plenty of foliage that you can use to make it a more attractive and aesthetic feel. Um, this is a snake that will use its tank and as such makes a superb display species. By using a Shade Dweller UVB tube at the basking site, you could also encourage the animal to actively seek out those UVB rays. This, of course, is optional. Snakes don't require it as a prerequisite, but more and more people are beginning to use it. Feeding is rarely, if ever, an issue. The only time there may be a problem is with males slowing down in winter. In the main, they are more reliable than corn snakes. They will accept mice, rats, gerbils, hamsters, multi-mammoths, chicks, small quail, and then quail and hen's eggs as they grow. Uh, black rat snakes usually benefit from brumation to ensure fertile egg production. Subsequent captive populations uh, may uh, be so many generations into uh, being captive bred that they no longer require it, but generally still seen as good practice to give them a winter cool down. Certainly the northern part of their range is one of the only snakes uh, that can possibly hold a torch to the hardiness of a Russian rat snake as a species that we encounter in captivity. Yes, yeah, sure, the, the common adder, Viperiberus, has got a pretty hardcore range as well, but not many people keep them. So uh, yeah, the Russian rat's just about the hardiest of all snakes that we keep in captivity. And this dude's running a close second, probably uh, maybe at a push, the uh, common garters and uh, northern water snakes as well, who also venture up into Canada as part of their natural range. 
Uh, post brumation uh, breeding will result in 12 to 25 eggs being laid. Uh, these can be incubated at 28 degrees Celsius for around 60 days. Uh, they will hatch out uh, using a uh, vermiculite to water mix of four to one. Uh, and th th they're pretty robust eggs, but there's no real issues with them. The hatchlings are a good size and generally kick in feeding straight away. Al although there might be a slight delay whilst they absorb the last of their yolk reserves that they took from their egg. Uh, but once they kick in, generally we're problem free and we're off to the races. Exceptionally large neonates may even accept fuzzies as their first meal. So just to recap, I only skated over it generally. So this is the map that's provided by Klaus Diet Schultz in, uh, oh, it's no good this mate, oh god, I can't breathe, I can't breathe lad. So this is the, the map provided by Klaus Diet Schultz and in it we've got different patterns denoting where the subspecies are from so to quickly run through them sort of clockwise, obsolete ran across the whole of the north, then we had quadrivitata or quadrivitatus which is the yellow. The straight lines down the bottom, uh, restricted to the Everglades, were Rossellini. If the Curti were included, they come from Key Largo and Key West, right down here. And interestingly, the Curti do not stripe out like either Rossellini or Quadrivitatus. Yet, that is now Alleghaniensis, the same as this. That stays saddled, stripe, stripe, saddle, saddle, saddle. So, you make up your own mind, very strange. This lower section here is Spiloids, which is the grey rat snake. And if William's eye was um, included, that would take up a portion of the, uh, the panhandle of Florida, Apalachicola region. And then down here uh, through Louisiana and Texas, we have the Texas rat snake or Lindheimer's rat snake, Lindhimeri. New science has it that that northern strip where that dot I've traced goes, which tracks the uh, Mississippi all the way down and including Lindheimer's is obsoletus. But Schultz had it that they went all the way across the top, bearing in mind that these snakes will have been dark or black snakes as well as these. Yet they've been decided that that black rat snake and that black rat snake are different species. Yeah. So anyway, we'll move on to climate data. Uh, we took a load because it's got a massive range and we've used Schultz's description. So to read out the localities that we've got, Glastonbury, Connecticut, uh, Dover, Delaware, Bethes Bethesda, Maryland, Independence, Missouri, Patterson, New Jersey, Scranton, Pennsylvania, Roanoke, Virginia, Morgantown, West Virginia, Chicago, Illinois, Rochester, New York, uh, Osage City, Kansas, uh, Davenport, Iowa, and Ashland, Nebraska, which represent, a, in broadest terms, this northern swathe of obsoleta. So we've tried to stay away from these as much as possible and track along the top. So at least that we're, we're paying a certain amount of deference to this. We're not going near Quadrivitatus, Spiloids or Lindheimer's original uh, descriptive uh, localities. And what it shows is that we've got a very defined daytime high average, which we've taken with a peak at 29.8 degrees in July uh, and a trough in winter at 3.31 degrees in January so very cool these animals are definitely going to brumate in in the wild uh, and their night times it's an even more harsh picture with an average maximum low of 5.7 peak maximum low in Davenport Iowa of minus nine as an average temperature in January and this animal comes from that region so anything below 10 they're asleep so we're going from mid-February to probably November so you know we've got a four month brumation period where these animals would uh, come to rest they would come out in the spring uh, spring would come the grasses the prey uh, the crops they help a lot of farmers out they would feed on their food bulk up breed mid to late some of the babies are born they have to trough as much food as they can before they fall into a brumation themselves they are tough as old boots completely unneedy very very hardy and get a bad rap uh the old school rat snakes when they were imported were heathens they were horrible um but the captive bred ones are as good as gold babies can be a little defensive and a little bit sort of strike happy but this tends to be more territoriality than temperament when removed from the viv they calm down brilliantly it just requires patience and a little bit of confidence um and you can see what you end up with which is a totally compliant 
completely unfazed snake. You're wonderful, aren't you? And for a black snake who's, you know, it, they, they're not exactly screaming. He is attractive. He is beautiful. These white interstitial saddle markings are ace. He's just a great looking snake. People are still asleep on the American Pantherophis. It's a real shame. We keep trying to push them in the shop with limited success, if I'm honest. We've had Gulf Hammocks, which are the Williams Eye. We've had Greys and stuff. And people just, they, they, don't, they don't appreciate them. And the problem is, if we don't keep producing them and keeping them, they're going to disappear. A lot of the regions of the obsolete complex are now protected and the animals can't be collected anymore. So if we're not working with them now and breeding them now, then we're potentially going to lose them in the future. And this is a serious thing that people need to switch on to. It isn't just all about the moss. It isn't just all about the money and stacking and racking and cramming them in and Pokemon, I've got to have them all. It's about preserving the diversity that we've always had and we've kind of took for granted. And, you know, you could do far worse than keep a snake such as the black rat. We'll be back with another video soon. We'll see you again soon, guys. All the best from me and Paul. We really appreciate the continuing support. Thank you ever so much. Peace.